From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined as always with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deckett. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, coming to you live from a universe of our own, straight to yours. What if we could build a perfect society? You guys, <gasps> what if we figure it out today? A utopia? Yeah, <laughs> like where scientists have full unregulated control. A technocracy. I'm so in. Uh, yeah, it, like it's weird, right? Because that's something pretty much all civilizations have aspired to. Nobody seems to get the concept of utopia right so far. And we'll also along the way tonight figure out why utopia is kind of a mean joke. Right. Like, isn't you? I, I almost think utopia and dystopia are synonymous in a weird <laughs> way, you know? You know, it's like. A lot of things that are in theory utopian do end up being dystopian in practice. And that's so much uh, film and fiction, right? They're essentially parables about how trying to make a perfect society goes terribly wrong. Shout out uh, Soylent Green, mm. Clockwork Orange. Communism. <laughs> I mean, come on, you know. <laughs> Communism sounds great in theory, but it just never quite worked out the way it seemed like it should on paper capitalism as well you know everybody's getting a little bit today uh <laughs> we we've got to also shout out this chilling line um matt i always i always defer to you on matrix knowledge at the very end of the matrix we're talking about this off air the architect um and paul pointed out there's a good way to do the voice but the architect uh is speaking with neo and says you know you're not in the first version of the matrix the first one I made was Paradise, and it was a monumental failure. I mean, and then, of course, the Fallout series, right? You didn't even oh, have God, to play yes. the game to like that show. Well, I mean, even like the the whole idea of the vault uh, situation is in and of itself a utopia that is going to lead to a greater utopia on Earth, but only after complete and total annihilation. That's almost like a, a prerequisite sometimes for a proper utopia, right? Well, in like today's episode, each one of those vaults is designed with some kind of experiment like for utopia. Could this be a utopia if these parameters are set? If we tweak X, we change Y, we futz with Z, uh, we will build a more perfect world. Yeah, in tonight's episode, we're exploring the story of one man who, depending on whom you ask, uh, who sought to apply the scientific method, just like you were saying, Matt, to the construction of civilization. He's a reasonable dude. He said, instead of trying out rules on humans, Instead of cooking live with empires, what if we start with rodents? Here are the facts. Let's start with a Tennessee boy named John Bumpa or Bumpus Calhoun. Uh, that is his middle name. And we had a we had a discussion about being adults. What if we spell it, Ben? <laughs> All right, Matt. B U M P A S S. Let's go to Noel because Noel wasn't here when we talked about this. Noel, <laughs> yeah. how would you pronounce this name? Uh, it's what you do at the club, y'all. You bump ass. <laughs> oh, <laughs> another legacy of his work, perhaps. <laughs> One can only imagine. <laughs> so this guy is a behavioral researcher. Uh, the fancy name for his specific field is ethologist, not an eth. Knowledgeist, not an ethicist, but instead someone who studies the behavior of non-human animals. Oh, yes. And this person is uh, highly influential, let's say. Uh, we, I think many, several of us, maybe all of us learned about him when Stuff You Should Know kind of like mentioned him way back in the day, almost 10 years ago on an episode called How Zero Population Growth Works. Yeah. And shout out, shout out to our pals, Josh, Chuck and Jerry. Uh, zero population growth. It's still it's really interesting, isn't it? To go back and hear that episode. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, it, I don't know. I it just again every once in a while I listen to SYSK again and I'm like, oh man, I love this show. Oh, they're lovely dudes. I think that was before my time, but I, I'm assuming the zero population growth is some concept involving eugenics or something. Is it, or is it something a little bit more l- less evil than that? It goes into things like Malthusianism or okay. Malthusian yeah, thoughts. Yeah, yeah. The so um, Georgia Guidestones y type stuff, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Maintainers yeah, keep population. The population yeah. to this number. Yes. Uh, yeah. Shout out to the population bomb. That's a book that also changed the game. Yeah. Cause it goes back to an early observation uh, by this Mal, the uh, Malthusian originator. The uh, Sith Lord. Yeah. <laughs> but the guy who said, hey, uh, population of humans it kind of grows exponentially but the amount of food that we're able to produce doesn't grow exponentially it's just got kind of this nice little <laughs> line that does increase over time but not at the same rate yeah he looked at he looked at that the dreaded xy axis right <laughs> yeah. and said there's an inflection point upon which the s hits the f and he wasn't talking about san francisco but he but he thought uh he thought the s was going to hit the f around the year like i don't know like before the year 2000 oh uh, yeah 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 josh josh in that episode mentions that he thought uh what year 2000 is when london like britain for the most part would no longer exist because it will have torn itself apart <laughs> so this guy's essentially like an academic doom prophet uh that guy thomas malthus yes. yeah, yeah yeah and he's he's kind of more in the realm of economics yeah, yeah, but there is a uh, underlying um, academic bent to his predictions. He's not just like fully, you know, I, I've I've had a vision and this is what I've seen. <laughs> yeah, he didn't think God told him. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. He Important thought, distinction. I would just yeah. Try to, he yeah. thought it was based on quantitative research and trends as he saw him at the time. Thomas Malthus, uh, you know him, you know him. He was so having, enthusiastic about it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're having a good day and the day's too good. Check out some of his work. Uh, but back People to use our, that as yeah. a term, right? If you're Malthusian, yes. then you're sort of Huge. like a naysayer kind of, right? Or Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, they wouldn't call themselves naysayers. They would call themselves realists. Right, there you go. Which is what most pessimistic people do. There you go. I'm shrugging, everybody. No, I know it's, it's fair. an audio it's podcast. Uh, so this, back to our guy, Doc Calhoun. The first thing we have to understand about his studies is, is they're often mischaracterized uh, with the idea, like you'll read about it in pop science or whatever, and the idea is presented as though Calhoun attempted to construct a perfect society for various rodents, and from there, figure out how to create a better society for humans. This isn't really the case. What he actually did is remove a lot of the usual population constraint variables or the mortality creators because it wasn't because he wanted a a paradise, really, for rodents. He was interested instead in the effects of proximity and population, overpopulation in particular. Shout out Malthus. Uh, Maybe we learn a little bit about him because I didn't know this. He taught at Emory University, just up the road from us. Indeed. Uh, A graduate of Northwestern. He did teach uh, at Emory as well as Ohio State. Uh, And then he uh, moved with his wife to Maryland, where he settled down uh, at Johns Hopkins in March of 1947, where he began a 28-month study of a colony of North Norwegian rats um, in a 10,000 square foot uh, enclosure. Kind of sounds like a bit of a barn, you know, an out outbuilding kind of situation. Um, there were five females in this cohort uh, that over the time span were theoretically able to produce 5,000 healthy offspring uh, for this particular size enclosure. Um, and Calhoun found that the population never exceeded 200 individuals uh, and eventually stabilized at 150. Uh, just really quick, brown Norway rats, if you want to buy them. Uh, a male at three weeks old costs $109.29. A female costs $111.03. Just That's a pricey rat. Shout out Secret of Nim. 
Isn't it? Wouldn't you say that's a, uh, I would think I would have thought that rats would be typically less expensive than that. I mean, you can catch them for free. That's true. <laughs> well, and that's uh, 2024 numbers. We're talking 1947. So yeah, probably they were a just different. giving rats away at that point. Right. <laughs> well, well, it should be noted when we're thinking about these rats, these are like control rats, right? Yes. They are designed to be almost identical so that when you test one like a variable with one and another as a control you're actually going to be able to test that variable without any other intervening variables yeah because the um they're bred to like you said they're bred to be relatively homogenous right um not to the point where they will become quickly incestuous, but they're also more importantly bred to not have prominent genetic defects or uh, susceptibility to certain diseases. And uh, they're kind of same samey. Uh, I also want to shout out rat intelligence. Uh, there's a book that our pal Robert Lamb and I uh, really love called Rats Observations on the History and Habitat of the City's Most Unwanted Inhabitants. And it focuses on rats in New York. And it's amazing. It's a really Dude. weird read. They have huge balls, by the way. Rats Ooh. have huge balls. <laughs> I mean, literally and figuratively. <laughs> all They're, all yeah. of that. Speaking of and also not speaking of, just one one more statistic here with brown Norway rats from this specific catalog that I'm looking at. You can get a lactating rat with litter for six hundred and ninety three dollars and ten cents. That is what a, again, kind of litter is that? I, I don't know, but it's a brown Norway rat. It's uh, would you try rat milk? Just wondering. Well, yes. I guess what I'm saying is for these types of tests, you can get very specific with the kind of rat. The like what state that rat is in, how many weeks old that rat is, if it's already no longer breeding, it's it's just crazy. So, it, it, speaking of weird stuff, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. He the technology is not here yet for Calhoun to scope in um, to this level to twenty twenty four level of rat eugenics, for lack of a better term. Uh, but he finds something mysterious, and it haunts the world today. Like you were saying, Noel. This enclosure could theoretically house safely 5,000 rats in this population, but it stabilizes at 150, just 150 rats. So we ask, what gives? He also notices these rats are not forming a little rat nation state. Instead, they're splitting up into colonies the si uh, into colonies of about a dozen, which is the size that would naturally occur in the wild before these different mortality variables kicked in, predators, disease, lack of food, et cetera. Uh, and he's thinking, well, what, why? We, I took away all the stresses, you know? Literally, they are living the best life. They're just in a cage, uh, despite all their rage. And later, he moves, Stop. <laughs> and so later he moves to Maine, and he continues to study these Norway rats uh, until about 1951. Eventually the family goes back to Maryland. His studies continue. He moves into other rodents. Uh, we're going to mention an outfit called the National Institute of Mental Health uh, pretty often. <laughs> it is indeed the secret of NIM. Uh, and in the, what a film. it's true. It's true. I didn't get it when I, I didn't know saw the film. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 It's an yeah. acronym. Mm -hmm. uh, so he did uh, NIM gets, some land outside of a town called Poolsville, Maryland. And uh, he headed a couple of projects there. He began his most famous series of experiments, not on the rats, but on mice. And he built these different fallout vaults for mice. And uh, he called them, in a burst of humility, universes. <laughs> and it's a high fluting name. But the science is astonishing. Here's the... They wanted to see what happened when rodents lived without the stresses of life in the wild, uh, limitless food, limitless water. I kid you not, little rat condos, little mouse yeah. condos. Well, imagine this is this enclosure. And remember, the first one that went when he was testing earlier, he had this huge 10,000 square foot area where he's watching all the different mice kind of grouping off like that. He wanted to see them in these much smaller little spaces, right? As you said, with limitless resources. But if you imagine the 
starter mice, right? That began in that quote universe that he created. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of the preceding mice that are born from those original mice only know that Mm. thing, that enclosure that has the walls up that they can't climb over. Right. So it really is the entirety of their universe. They've never been outside of Plato's cavern. You know what I mean? They're still plugged into the matrix from the cradle to the grave. That's an excellent observation. And these were all, this was all again, not because the guy loves happy rats and happy mice. He wants to learn about population density and how it affects behavior. So he says, I will build for thee a utopia. What could go wrong? Pretty much everything. This is the story of universe 25. We'll get into it after a word from our sponsors. Here's where it gets crazy. Let's go back to this really interesting thing uh, that you said at the top, Noel, the concept of utopia. Uh, you said what it, it, it always feels like uh, it becomes a dystopia. It's, it's so weird because back in 1516, the word was coined as a kind of like snarky, mean joke. It's like a thing that's not attainable, almost, right? Like, it's it's impossible. Um, it was uh, coined by Sir Thomas More in 1560. He created the word from the Greek words for not and place. Um, ou for not and, and topos for place. Um, so it meant nowhere. It's a it's a it's a liminal space. It's a non-existent thing. So before the dawn of modern science, the guy who coined the word that we use to, to describe a perfect society was literally thumbing his nose at the concept uh, in its entirety. Um, but, pretty funny. But you tell. guys, you guys, what if he's really talking about that infinite nothingness that we all experience upon the moment of death before the light of everything comes to Bro. gather us? You know what I'm saying? It all or extends you, into infinity. Yeah. <laughs> when you write an email into the void here and sometimes the void writes back. You know yeah. what I mean? Sometimes you get a subsystem undeliverable message uh, back as well. You Maybe know? it really is a good thing is what I'm saying, guys. Welcome to the emptiness. Calhoun's experiments seemed in a weird way to bear out Moore's joke. And we don't know what he thought about the work of Sir Thomas More. But um, from these rats, he... He moved on. He couldn't always call them universes, though that was very fun. And we'll see he loves fun language. Uh, He originally called the, the mice experiments mortality inhibiting environment for mice. Uh, and, uh, like you were saying, it's July of 1968 when he introduces, uh, a breeding group such that it could avoid inbreeding into a new habitat called universe 25. And, you know, again, we're saying universe is a little bit ambitious for this one because it's not super big. Yeah, and I'm sure Fallout was inspired by a lot of things. Like, there's there's so many examples of these types of isolated communities, experiments, whether they be with animals or, you know, prison experiments or whatever. But 100%. But I can't help but think Universe 25, Vault 111, you know what I mean? Like, it really does have a, a, a nice connective tissue. Yeah. Well, again, as we said before, he went from 10,000 square feet in 1947 to nine square feet of metal. Yikes. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, it is much smaller. But again, as you pointed out so astutely, the mice involved don't know this. Mm -mm. Their kids, their progeny certainly will never know this. Uh, Nine foot square. It's a metal pan. The sides are about 4.5 feet high, uh, which is not really a huge problem for rats, depending on the surface, but is pretty difficult for mice to, yes. to summit that. Well, and I think it's the, the top 17 inches, if you imagine from the height, top of this thing down, 17 inches is like just bare wall that yeah. is very difficult to scale. So you can climb up a little bit, right, to get to your little mouse condo. Yeah, it's designed that way, right, to mm-hmm. go up to the condos, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is weird. Yeah, nesting boxes, food hoppers, water dispensers. It is like it, it, it is like a mouse episode of Cribs to date ourselves with MTV references. 
Uh, and uh, there were no predators, obviously. There's just this benevolent yet distant human thing that functions as God for these guys. Every four to eight weeks, they get hit with their equivalent of a, you know, a natural disaster, a calamitous event, because that's when the enclosure is cleaned. You know what I mean? So maybe, and we don't know, if, and we don't know enough about. Uh, their cognition to know whether this became a story they told each other about. Right. Oh, we dude. also don't know whether they could predict the coming of the cleaning. Oh, <laughs> the coming of the, <laughs> the cleaning. plow, the plow is coming. <laughs> well, because it did have to be cleaned out on a regular basis, right? I yeah, mean, that was it, one of the yeah. things. Yeah. There's still, I mean, they're like the top tier lap mice but they still poop. We haven't figured out how to make mice not poop. Do you think that like mice in this kind of situation have a sense of what's going on outside, you know, or like, do they, do they look at, I know, I know we couldn't possibly, you know, get inside the head or, or try to simulate the cognition of, of rats, but like these, these forces that come in and remove them and clean them and then put them back. Do you think they look at them as like godlike force? You know, I don't know. Yeah. Alien abductions. It'd be, yeah. Some kind of weird part of just aspect of the universe that happens, but there's no human. You're not actually interacting with the human at any time whose arms are coming down and cleaning things. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's just this, these disembodied limbs that descend into your world and then, you know, <laughs> wipe off the surfaces or whatever. They probably recognize smells, I'm thinking. But to your point, it's probably just a thing in their environment. I do imagine they are intelligent enough to envision something past the wall, right? Because they are naturally exploring creatures, mm -hmm. right? So they, without knowing what is out there, they uh, many of them attempted to escape at some point, especially if stuff did not work out as mouse society collapsed, which is exactly what happened. The only obstacle in universe 25 and the preceding experiments was space. So you got these eight mice in this enclosure. At first, the, their vault is huge. Uh, it's designed to hold as many as um, people round up to 4,000. But I think in the original research, it was something like 3,840 mice, which yeah. is a lot of mice. Well, and it took them a long time to get acclimated to that space too, right? Those original eight mice, the four breeding pairs, they like didn't breed for a long time. They were just kind of like, what the heck is this place? I don't understand this. This is wrong. Why are we here? And then eventually they just gave in and, or, you know, whatever they, whatever change occurred cognitively that they went, okay, we will begin nesting. We will begin breeding. It was better than the breeding pens from which they originated. I can only imagine. It's definitely a lot more room because they weren't caught in the wild, right? Exactly. But it did take 104 days before they actually settled down to reproduce. Mm -hmm. And when the population began reproducing, they were doubling every 55 days. So this is J-curve growth for a while. And by day 315... So we're not quite a year in. The population has reached 620 mice. Gangbusters. Tickety-boo. Everything's going well. Until around day 315, it was like some invisible switch just clicked. And the population growth, the rate of growth, not the actual population yet, the rate of growth declined. And now it was only doubling every 145 days instead of every 55 days. And with that, in step, the social structure broke down. There's a great article by um, writer Esther Inglis Arkel uh, for io9 or Gizmodo now that sums it up. And it's pretty crazy. Yeah, to, to read from that uh, piece, uh, at the peak population, most mice spent every living second in the company of hundreds of other mice. They gathered in the main squares waiting to be fed and occasionally attacking each other. Few females carried pregnancies to term, and the ones that did seemed to simply forget about their babies. Uh, they'd move half their litter away from danger and forget the rest. Huh. Sometimes they'd drop and abandon a baby while they were carrying it. Guys, are you familiar with the concept of nesting behavior? Yes. 
Does this kind of figure into that in a way? Like, I mean, I, I don't know, like th- this is maybe anomalous nesting behavior, or I guess it's a situation that once it kind of balloons beyond a certain point, like that, that um, I guess, uh, motherly drive kind of gets weaker or something. Like what, what, what is this? What's, what's going on here? I would point people to Population Density and Social Pathology, which was written by Mr. John Calhoun, and he actually has in this, you, you can find it online, by the way, as in PDF yep. form, uh, he's got illustrations, basically, of what the, you're talking about, Noel, like the typical nesting behavior of mice in a population like this, how they build their nest, what they do, you know, when they're in an enclosed space and they've got the family in there and they you know, get all of the materials and arrange it in such a way that the mice can kind of gather. Um, but then what was happening then where it was completely different? Well, and a lot of nesting behavior, too, involves protecting the offspring from predators. So when you're in a situation where you don't have any natural enemies, you know, I wonder if that kind of freaks it out a little bit or right. like causes a little bit of a change in, in the way these processes happen. It gets even creepier, um, and and at a precipitous rate. And we'll get to we'll get to the paper that kind of changed popular science. Really, um, we should also mention just an example of what I think is a little bit creepy. Uh, Calhoun was also particularly interested in a subgroup of rodents that appeared inevitably in these universes. Uh, he called them. Tell me if you think this is creepy, folks. He, he called them the beautiful ones. Uh, they're like the Eloy in H.G. Wells's The Time Machine. Remember the time machine, like the surface-dwelling vegetarians? It, it's not a perfect comparison because the Eloy obviously reproduce, but the beautiful ones do not. They got like they post one male, uh, one male rodent outside, and then the rest retreat into a secluded nesting spot in the habitat usually elevated i think and they just eat groom themselves and sleep they don't fight they don't care for their young they don't reproduce they're immune in a way to the social collapse that occurs which is so weird Mm. it's it's so weird they would do that Mm. yeah they just checked out it reminds me a little bit of um what is it in Japan, Hikikomori, um, or there's some other country. I think it's China where there's a group of people who have done what they call the lay down movement. They just check out a society. I mean, it's too stressful. I, I, I'll do the bare minimum. But is that better than what's happening to the rest of the rodent population? Wherein there's cannibalism, there is hyper non consensual pansexualism. And there's random violence. Yeah. And a 96, roughly 96% mortality rate for newly born mice. Yes. Yeah. The last surviving mouse in universe 25 is born on day 600. Right. And the population then has reached 2,220 mice. The experiment again set up for 4,000, but they just, as a society, they stopped. They stop mousing. And how do we explain this strange, deeply disturbing trend? What made this perfect world so intolerably terrible that the test group failed to reach full capacity? Even once, not even once. Um, We could dive into it after a word from our sponsor. Dang it! Another line! There's surge pricing in the shoe store now! Sorry, bud. You know how it is. There are more and more people in the one shoe store, and most of them also have two feet. I just can't take this! I've had it! It's enough to make you go bonkers! <laughs> of course. Going bonkers is available on the premium app version. Also, I know what you mean. Every day I wake up and I think, Is today the day? Is today the day I bring the bomb to work and end this pointless Sisyphean charade? Something troubling you, friends? No, shoes are just hats for feet, you know. You could also go to a haberdashery. It's not even the shoes. It's just, look around. It's all gotten out of hand. Wherever I go, there's a crowd, a line, an app. I can't remember the last time I was able to just be alone. Well, 
If this civilization is too crowded, which we all understand, then why not try a universe all your own? Is that another app? Oh, much more than that, gentlemen. What if I told you right now you could have a universe to yourself? The universe. Y O U universe. Hmm. Y O universe. Yes, the universe. Think of it as a planned community, the most exclusive sort, with a population of one. You. Gone are the days of competing for resources, ideology, or the ability to feel seen in society. The universe provides you with an all encompassing, self contained reality. You simply agree to a small bit of blood harvesting and DNA sampling, undergo a small procedure for the helmet, and voila! A blood helmet procedure? I said, and voila! Imagine a world in which you never feel rushed, in which other people only exist should you allow them to do so. A world, a universe, with no dissenting opinions, no uncomfortable truths. Every social media comment agrees with you. Every email is a yes and right on. Everything you want is provided, sustaining your base needs. Every single... I'm in. You don't want to hear the rest? Not really. This sounds great. Can I have a shoe store in my Y.O. universe? You can imagine anything you want here. Don't, don't you mean there? No. Oh, don't you see, friends? You're here. Right now. Universe is in practice responsible for, but legally indemnified and thus not liable for the following possible side effects. Isolation, madness, the condition, mega cube, poor noise complaint, social media fatigue, echo chambers, biospheres of the mind, random act of violence, loss of sexual appetite, loss of general appetite, loss of perspective, loss of memory, loss of precognitive ability, inability to care for others, sociopathy, psychopathy, hyperflatulence, self herpes, self help, cranial bleed, neck pain due to alleged helmet effects currently not approved in the following states Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, state of happiness, and peaceful state of mind. Universe is a subsidiary of Illumination Global Unlimited. <laughs> So let's return to something you mentioned uh, just a bit earlier, Matt, which is the revolutionary 1962 paper issued in Scientific American, uh, <laughs> wherein wherein he um, this is still pre Universe 25. This is still Norway Rat era. Uh, he introduces the lay public to the idea of what are called behavioral sinks. So here's an excerpt. Uh, Many female rats are unable to carry the pregnancy to full term or to survive delivery of their litters if they did. Uh, An even greater number after successfully giving birth fell short in their maternal functions. So, yeah, I mean, again, we're seeing this weird erosion of, of what are typically the strongest of biological drives, you know, um, what I just, I'm sorry. I keep saying it, but what, what gives this is wild. Yeah. Let's actually jump to the article really quickly. Cause this is kind of what I wanted to mention when we were talking about nesting behavior. Um, if you go down, I think it's page 146 in the original, like scientific American, uh, you can find it with those illustrations of the nesting behavior. I just want to read the normal one. And then one of you guys read the, read the, uh, what was happening, what we're describing here. So normal maternal behavior among these rat populations would include building a fluffy, well-shaped nest for the young in an enclosed space in one of those little condos that we were describing earlier. And uh, it would be flattened by the weight of the animal's bodies, but it still offers ample protection and warmth for their tiny, young, you know, little rat bodies. And when they've got this kind of environment, the offspring are generally uh, what well, it's termed here weaned, right? Uh, and they are able to leave the nest after a certain amount of time. But about what was two happening? Weeks, right? Yeah, about two weeks. So what was happening during these experiments with these behavioral sinks? Yeah, this is where Calhoun introduces abnormal behavior, um, which is look, he anthropomorphizes a lot, and when you see this especially if you have kids, it's kind of heartbreaking because the abnormal behavior, quote, shown by females exposed to the pressures of population density includes failure to build adequate nest. And you can see the drawing on the left, the diagram um, of a quote unquote disturbed female, not like a bad mouse or a bad, not a bad rat, but instead uh, pressured by mm-hmm. this increasingly surreal environment she start quote she started to make a nest but never finished it the drawing on the right shows her young about two weeks later um they're leaving the nest 
as we use the old cliche appropriately, uh, but they are not old enough to survive alone. And this is where the 96% infant mortality rate statistic comes from. You can also see when it says starting to make a nest, the bedding they're provided with, it's like these rectangular strips. And in the normal nesting behavior, it's a hoarder's house. Yeah. You know, it, it literally becomes what you would imagine a nest would look like if you've ever seen a bird's nest or something, but just with these strips of fabric. And in the abnormal behavior, we're looking at like, oh, it's terrible. It makes me think of neglected children because that's what happened. Yeah. I'm anthropomorphizing. Anyway, yeah, it's terrible. Uh, and, it, and the world that these uh, young mice who can't survive on their own are entering is a very violent, chaotic place. S is hitting the F in universe 25. Uh, a lot of the largely male population has disturbing behavior at a rate that far exceeds what would happen in the wild. Rats can practice cannibalism if they have to. These rats don't have to practice cannibalism, but they're doing it. They're super into it. They're also um, banging literally everything, sexually banging everything. <laughs> Um, without Oof. regard to the normal constraints of uh, reproduction or the normal goals. I think maybe that's the big thing. It seems like the goal is gone now, right? So now it's just, oh, I was going to say do what thou wilt, but that's not, but that's not even it. It's like, it's frenetic behavior. It's like, um, it's agitated. Ain't always right, and it, and it's not like there's some sort of hedonistic drive. You know, mice don't understand. You know, Satanism or the idea of do what thou wilt per se. It's a, uh, a a biological imperative that's kind of been flipped in a weird and disturbing way. It's not like they're hey, let's just just go ham and like live no. in like a weird cannibalistic hippie commune to get you know whatever. I think, Ben, you put it really well, like the goal, the original, I don't know, um, uh, I was going to, I was going to, I think you said it right, like just the goals, the things that you have as, as mouse, those are no longer applicable because of yes. the pressures you're existing in. Yeah, and we're using rat and mouse uh, here interchangeably because, uh, because the trends are consistent across the universes. That's the, the, the scary thing. The rat and the mouse, they're close enough that the stories are beat for beat very similar. And this, like, um, what do you call it? Uh, this impetus that we're talking about when, when you're in an environment where that impetus is somehow curtailed or interfered with, we see the over and over again, we see the population generally goes in two behavioral directions. A lot of people, like we're saying, See, now I'm completing it. Uh, they, they, go, uh, they go ham, you know? They're almost like the reavers in Serenity. Uh, and yeah, and the other folks are the ones where the Pax virus works. Spoilers. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, it's so easy to anthropomorphize this and like say something like they became evil, right? But that's, that's not right. You know, there's just something in their coding that no longer applied and they just kind of went berserk because like the normal like soci sociological and biological things that kind of kept them acting like what they are, rats and mice, no longer applied. And therefore their their programming, for lack of a better term, didn't know how to operate anymore. So it just kind of like it's like they short circuited almost. Right. Well, and you're. It's so it's so confusing to me because you're not necessarily competing for the food when the food comes out, right? There's ample food. They're just eating their dead, food. though, right? They're, it's cannibaliz cannibalizing the the dead. It's not like they're are they killing each other and then yeah. eating too? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, I'm sorry, man. I just had to By clarify. Choice. Please continue. That's wild. But what I'm saying is, like, they could have just eaten the food, but there's so many of them. It, it is almost. I I don't know. I. I think maybe that's why it's so confusing to me. You could always go and get water, but you got to now like either wait in line or fight to go get the water. Is, but is it's this there. The, It'll always be there. You just got to get to it now. Is this the kind of study that would probably be looked at a bit askance today? Like this is a little on the uh, immoral side or on the unethical side. You can still do stuff like this because mm -hmm. it's, because they're rodents, you yeah, can okay. still do stuff like this, depending on the country. But also, this research, as we'll see, gets weaponized. Um, 
and and used as a, a metaphor for all kinds of things, perhaps incorrectly. Uh, we do know we do know there's scholarship suggesting maybe this is not a problem of population density so much as a problem of distribution of that population, right? So, uh, and we see things like this happening in the world. There are parts of the world that are struggling to maintain a population at the same time. There are parts of the world where the population is exploding in a way that that civilization is not prepared for, right? Uh, so there's, I mean, it gets into this really weird controversial possibly evil math but we know that we we know that what would happen is think of it like a gen pop right you're in a jail you can choose to go into your own cell right you can be by yourself in that cell or you can go down to gen pop right where everything is where it's party time uh, <laughs> but not excellent and uh the rats uh, Calhoun hypothesizes they began to associate feeding with being around a big crowd of rats. They didn't understand that they could eat on their own, which is fascinating from a very un like ethics aside. That is fascinating and chilling. Uh, so these, well, and then it becomes yeah. a learned behavior because right. let's let's imagine you are a successful uh, rat or mouse that made it into the general population after me, nesting you watch all of the rats gather together in this huge mass when it's time to eat so you go well i guess that's how that's what happens when it's time for me to eat now and then it, that behavioral pattern then passes down as like oh that's what this is what society does so this is what i do so yeah this is this is what i'm supposed to do listen here mouse son you'll eat like i ate and your father <laughs> and my father before you in a crowd, ready to fight and maybe eat another animal. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised there wasn't a group of older mice hanging out in the corner. Just like, I remember when we oh, used yeah. to eat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I remember there were just eight of us in the beginning. Uphill uh, both ways. <laughs> Uphill both Eating ways. Eating dead all the way. <laughs> so he also, we should note, as we said, he had a lot of anthropomorphizing and you can see it in the language he uses, which is purposely chosen to communicate with the public because it occurs in a larger context. Uh, he calls the, the dwelling places, tower blocks, basically apartments. He calls them walk up apartments. Uh, he That's sort of a British parlance, right? Tower blocks, like flat blocks. Yeah, like uh, almost like referring to what we might over here call projects or like, um, you know, government like subsidized housing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. That's kind of how he's talking. Yeah. Um, and he's doing that to draw, draw out this comparison to human society in the time of which he's writing and conducting science. He also so calls some groups, juvenile delinquents and dropouts. Uh, he's actively inviting us to think in this manner. So it should be no surprise that human civilization not just scientists and academics and ethologists, human civilization in general learns about this stuff primarily through the Scientific American article. And they immediately say, well, what does this tell us about ourselves? Uh, and what does this tell us about Thomas Malthus? Uh, and while this is occurring, there has been a bevy of academics who might as well be wearing sandwich boards that say the end is nigh. You know. Um, Ecologists, economists, philosophers, tycoons. Tycoons love Malthusian thought. And we do have some good examples. Uh, first off, William Vogt uh, and Fairfield Osborne um, were two ecologists uh, who warned against the growing population, um, putting pressure on natural resources, on food. Uh, and that was as early as 1948. So people have been like sounding the alarms for this stuff for a long time. Um, and it ain't getting a whole heck of a lot better if we're being completely honest. And it does feel like, you know, if we're being dire about our situation that we find ourselves in or think about what's going to be the tipping point in like 
a big, you know, high water mark moment uh, in humanity. It's going to be a war over resources. I mean, we it's pretty clear um, that that's going to that's the one thing that we can't really make more of. And people who have control and have power is going to start hoarding them, uh, leaving, you know, the, the, the lesser of us out uh, in the cold. Well, yeah, I mean, Fairfield Osborne, this dude, this is a eugenicist who was born in the 1800s, like died in 1935, and he was talking about it back then. And as a eugenicist, he had some ideas. I bet he did. Uh, he had some takes. He had some yeah. takes. Um, so, you know, it's weird. It's a weird thing because it is a cautionary subject where if you start looking at this too much and you're applying whatever, um, I, don't, I don't know what we would even call them, your own biases that you've got from growing up wherever you grew up and with the people you're around. You, 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 it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and again, we have this, um, oh gosh, you know what? I'm just realizing I'm thinking through Osborne was alive when the great depression hit. Mm -hmm. So he probably died thinking, called it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then in 1968, in the same sort of social milieu or context, Paul Ehrlich publishes The Population Bomb. It is polemical. It is an alarmist work. It is meant to shake you when you read it. Uh, and he says, it's coming. Famine, resource wars, the end of days. So the public is primed to think in these terms. You know, they've witnessed horrific wars. They've seen uh, what happens when uh, the economic regimes collapse. So when Calhoun comes out in Scientific American, which is a legit uh, publication, they are totally vibing with it. He says, look, overpopulation means social collapse followed by extinction. The rodents are not so different from the primates. Uh, and the more I repeat this experiment, the more predictable and inevitable the outcome seems. Uh, by the time he got to Universe 25, the most popular or most well-known one, he had a formula, a death squared formula, which we don't have to go into, but basically uh, he was thinking of the concept of second death. So first death being the physical death of an individual, second death being the larger death of a society. Very fun at parties, I imagine. But um, I don't know. Uh <sighs> That's the question. Though. That's the pickle we're still working with. Can we apply this to humans? Calhoun was certain this could also be a warning call for human society, no matter how smart we think we are, he reasoned, because um, he did count himself as human. You know, he's like, I'm in this universe, too. Uh, he said, no matter what happens, once the number of individuals capable of fulfilling certain roles uh, once that exceeds the number of roles available, basically, once there are too many cars for the parking lot of a civilization, chaos reigns. Oh, yeah. you mean like students graduating from elite colleges don't have jobs to fill? Mm. Students graduating from non-elite colleges don't have jobs to fill anymore and something like AI comes along and fills all those roles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or like the fact that uh, Star Trek sort of glosses over uh, the fact uh, how they went from a post work economy after living through a per post worker economy. Yeah, they don't put a lot of that on the air, but <laughs> it just it just worked out, you know. It just worked out. Let's go to the hollow deck. Uh, he he writes he writes beautifully about this, um, and I don't think he's trying to be a jerk. I think he is trying to present what he sees as the science. Like we've got, again, you can read the full paper or the full article online today, and it is worth your time. But uh, he, he concludes that when you get to that too many cars for the parking spot situation, the only result is violence and disruption of social organization. And he's not arguing ideology. Here, Very important to note, because it does get weaponized by people with different ideologies. He's just saying that when he says social organization, he's talking about the way rodents usually work, the way they usually self-organize. Uh, and now they're doing stuff that is not normal. Social pessimists, Malthusians, whatever we want to call them, 
They loved this stuff. This was to them um, an inarguable rule of the world, of reality. This was like the law of gravity for living things. Trippy stuff. So I got lost in this article from Cabinet Magazine. They've got the great illustrations, too. It's pictures of the actual structure that does resemble some kind of prison to me when you just mm-hmm. look at this tiny little nine-foot squared thing. Um, uh, I don't know, a great picture of John Calhoun. Mm-hmm. And he, he looks troubled, too. In his face, he's just like, oh, God. <sighs> These dropout mice. <laughs> Haggard. Also, do you guys remember um, a while back when I was living, I was living in that place right next to our old office. And the, the courtyard of that looked very Universe 25 to me. Oh, yeah. With the weird, like, <laughs> atrium, the plants yeah, and stuff. It kind of yeah. felt like, like, pretend outside. You know? <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah, we have outside at home. That's uh, what it was. Uh, so, look, he is, he is perhaps mischaracterized pretty often because he argued that there were good guys. And that part of his research, I think, gets glossed over. He was very interested in something he called the high social velocity mice. These were uh, these were individual mice who responded to these new overpopulation pressures by switching things up, by doing interesting, uh, very varied behaviors. Like they would alter, you know, if there's a big gen pop crowd at feeding time, they would move in the night. They would move when the other mice were less active or whatever their version of night was. Uh, They would team up and create alliances that ordinarily would not exist. Uh, So he found great hope in that. And he says, look, humanity is a positive animal, creative, capable of design. Maybe we can out-tech this damning doomsday prediction for society. I don't know. Oh, but it's weird. It. uh... There's another article from, oh gosh, that's not the Vox article I was looking at. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, uh, Smithsonian. Uh, the Appendix. The Appendix. Uh, the Appendix has an interesting article on this, specifically on John Calhoun. And they discuss, uh, or this article, at least let's cite it so you can look it up. It's titled Space Cadets and Rat Utopias, yeah. written by Laura Jane Martin. So this concept of space cadets is something that John Calhoun was really into because at least according to the article, according to other writings about him, he wanted this to be a positive thing. He wanted yes. humans to look at it and go, hey, we can fix these major problems we've got going on, even if population seems to be this doomsday, you know, on the horizon somewhere. We, If we're aware of it, we can fix all the things that lead to it. And why not, as one of those fixes, let's focus on getting the heck off Earth. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Shout out to his partner in that letter, Dull. Uh, D U H L. Uh, I I love you mentioning that because he has the analogy that, as far as we know, the analogy he did not make, but would be apparent to those of us in the cage today, is uh, that he's like a a climate change person, right? He's like a climatologist, but for society, and he's saying, "Look, we're reaching this behavioral sink point, but we're not at the pa- we're not past the point of no return." Right. We can still mitigate and perhaps even repair the tendencies we don't like. And Space Cadets is really interesting. Um, it's one of those technocratic, very optimistic think tanks. You know, like if we want to get to space, it's going to take all of the experts we can possibly think of. You know, let's get the architects, uh, but let's also make sure we have the psychiatrist. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I don't know too much about the space cadets to be candid, but I do know that um, I do know that he had great faith in humanity. And he said, you know, maybe the rats are breaking down because they don't know what to do. The mice are breaking down because they don't know what to do. But the history of humanity is a history of innovation, of deviation from tradition and norm. Yeah, man. So far. He paused and said, so far. <laughs> That'd be uh, funny. I, guys, we should point out the, um, what do they call them? Some of those guys, they refer to them as Neo-Malthusians, like the new generation, you know? Um, and 
I didn't know until I listened to that stuff you should know episode that there there are things I want to shout out they did in their episode they shouted out a thing called population connection that I had never heard of before which is a website you can go to right now that is basically a spin-off from uh well it was a it was formerly known as ZPG or zero population growth and it's this fairly large organization that focuses specifically on eliminating all non-planned births Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because theoretically you could bring the numbers of like human replacement, you know, that like what 2.1 births per couple or whatever that, you know, old thing is that was based on like how to replace uh, human beings. Well, that's downright un-American. The accidental pregnancy is is a foundation of our society. (laughs) Hold my beer. (laughs) Well, well, guys, it's one (laughs) 30 a.m. You go home. I'm in love with her. Yeah. Well, I, look, again, I don't mean to speak for Population Connection because I don't know that much about them. Sure. I'm going off of what their website says, uh, yeah. populationconnection.org, and what was spoken about on that episode. But it does seem like they were focused heavily on empowering people to know about pregnancy, how it occurs, how to prevent it, um, and like providing resources, basically, to people across the planet. We're not talking about one place. We're talking like... Make sure everybody knows exactly what to do and how to prevent pregnancy until they are ready for it. Because isn't it interesting how sex ed is still in a lot of ways controversial? Like, you know, it doesn't feel like it's uniformly applied where it seems like, you know, at that age, it's probably the perfect time to empower young people with that kind of information. But it's like it's cringe for some reason or like parents, it freaks them out. But it really is probably smart thing to do. Just like we don't teach kids about how to, like, manage their money. And you, you know, know it's kind of weird. Also, uh, yeah, numerous studies prove, apolitical, non-ideological, objective studies prove that when you empower, um, when you empower women or people who are able to carry a child with, uh, with sexual education, objective sexual education, none of that fire and brimstone stuff, no. then you will you will see positive, substantial benefits to the society in which those people exist and their quality of life, uh, access to education, all of it improves. It's better for everyone. I do want to, and I'm saying that to make up for my crass last call at the bar joke. Uh, well, and, you know, and, and I, you find love where you find it. Well, and I, I would like to, to walk back, not walk back, but I, I said it's downright on American to, <laughs> to cut down on unplanned pregnancies. I say that as a, a, a dig on myself. I was in a, a committed relationship, uh, but our pregnancy was absolutely not planned. Um, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I'm, I'm, I couldn't be happier being the father of, of my amazing kid uh, of 15 now, but it certainly wasn't at the time something that, um, that we, you know, intended, but also I very much knew about all the things and I was just still kind of a dumb dumb, or we just weren't being careful because maybe it wasn't like the worst thing that could happen, but we definitely didn't do it on purpose. I have a, I have a distinct memory, not going too, too personally, or I have a distinct memory. I'm going to shout out coach C, uh, where I was at the time, our sex ed program in a relatively, uh, conservative part of the world was the extra side work assigned to the football coach. And it had a football voice. And so he yeah. he, he took us all. Did he, he also segregated, teach history? Segregated by sex. And I'm sure he had to do social studies at some yeah, point. Exactly. But he seg- they segregated um, the co- cohort by the biological sex or whatever. And so he came out and he had like one of those old pull-down posters. It was a diagram. And he had like a little you know, a pointer thingy. And he goes, we all adults. And someone's like, we're in seventh grade. And he goes, shut up. This is a penis. <laughs> <laughs> and it went and on then he shit, then he, But he dropped trowel. Oh, geez. No, no. He no. was only pointing to the diagram. I'm He's just a very joking. nice guy. I'm just joking. But, but we're saying, you know, again, to your original point, Matt, um, education empowers, you know what I mean? Uh, and that's why, Knowledge is power is a cliche, and Calhoun is on to something when he is just trying to inform people. And he's been mischaracterized as a pessimist. A lot of people on very extreme spectrums of social thinking have weaponized his research in a way that he probably would not agree with. 
were he alive today. Um, but also on the way, man, if the afterlife is real and if you're listening, Dr. Calhoun, thank you so much for all the fiction you created too, in step with, you know, the crazy real world plans. And with that, thank you so much for tuning in, folks. We think there's a lot here, a lot more to dig into. And we touched on a lot of things uh, that may have per- you may have personal experience with in your own life, in your own neck of these global woods. So let us know. We'd be very interested to hear your favorite pieces of fiction inspired by Universe 25. And we'd also love to hear, uh, love, love to read your, your take on what this does or does not apply about human civilization. We try to be easy to find online. Conspiracy stuff on uh, Facebook, on X, FKA Twitter, and on YouTube. Check out the latest installment of George Washington's time travel adventures Uh, on Instagram and TikTok. We're Conspiracy Stuff Show. We have a phone number. You can call it. It's 1-833-STDWYTK. When you call in, you've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. Do give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. If you've got more to say than can fit in that little tiny three-minute message, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are. The folks who read every single email we get. Tell us about Dragon Lair. I can't believe Don Bluth made Dragon Lair. All right, anyway, conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.